está buscando, já existia uma aproximação da professora Cláudia com o professor Paulo Vitor, que é, e quer dizer, na realidade, fazer dessa aproximação é, uma aproximação realmente mais frutífera e quer dizer que a gente possa trabalhar né, junto. Quer dizer, então, assim, é um pouco a proposta que a gente está colocando. É, nesse escopo, quer dizer, o, o doutor Ronego estava vindo nessa colaboração, quer dizer, pelo programa Ciências Sem Fronteiras, e é, Bom, e, e foi viável, na realidade, a gente fazer esse evento hoje. Né? O doutor Ronegel é psicólogo e especialista reconhecido internacionalmente nas áreas de engenharia de resiliência, análise da confiabilidade humana, engenharia de sistemas cognitivos e sistemas homem-máquina. É autor de centenas de publicações e, em seus estudos, sugere que o cuidado de saúde é resiliente e que a abordagem para a segurança do paciente depende desse entendimento. Então, assim, o Dr. Ronego, ele vai fazer agora é, uma palestra para a gente em torno de 30, 40 minutos. É, e depois vamos ter um espaço para discussão, para perguntas. Né? O evento está sendo filmado, então, assim, eu, só, eu peço para, se alguém depois quiser fazer alguma pergunta, use o microfone. Né, por conta aqui dos no os nossos técnicos já solicitaram. Quer dizer, o Paulo Irã está aqui. Muito obrigada ao, né, pelo apoio aqui do pessoal aqui do ICIC. Tá ok? Então, tá, Dr. Ronego, I have already made the introduction, then please, you can begin. Ok, I hope. Uh, sorry, I hope. I'll stand up. It's it's uh, what I normally do. So thank thank you for inviting me to come here today and to to talk to you. Uh, I met some of you this morning. I met some of you many years ago. I realized so it's uh, it's nice to see familiar faces. We don't say old faces. We say familiar faces. It's more polite. Uh, so what I'm going to do is to talk about uh, resilient healthcare, which is something that, that I work with and have worked with for some years now and that I think might be interesting for you. It's a very short, uh, condensed uh, description of the ideas, basically the, the a different approach to uh, healthcare and to the safety issue that is uh, as a consequence of this kind of thinking. And then and I don't know what the plans are, but I'm very happy if you want to ask questions as we go along or interact. Or I know you're not shy, so I'm not worried about that. So. Okay. So the the uh, I mean the, the the starting point for all this has been, um, of course, the concern for patient safety and and for being safe and and the general issue in in healthcare and and I know it, now you're not treating patients here but you're producing drugs for instance so there's a safety issue in producing drugs obviously in dispensing drugs and using them in in having them as part of the treatment, and in other areas there's a concern for safety, and the general concern for safety is like this, uh, that if, if you say safe or safety, uh, what do people think about? What, what comes up in their mind? Well, they think about something that has gone wrong. They think about accidents and incidents. If I say safety, you immediately think of the latest calamity that you experienced or read about in the papers or whatever and that's what that's what we naturally think about when we say safety and that's so that's why we have definitions like this which are very common definitions of safety from different not from healthcare but from other other fields basically a system is safe if as little as possible goes wrong that's a normal understanding of safety in production, in treatment, in transportation, in, in whatever. And it makes a lot of sense, of course. We don't want anything to go wrong. 
we don't we were just in up in the car so we don't want anyone to fall down the stairs as you, as as you walk down these are quite steep stairs we don't want anything to go wrong we don't want any piece of masonry to cut loose and hit me on the head i just stand outside then that's that's sensible enough that's safety okay so if you take healthcare then of course since since the 1990s there's been a huge concern for patient safety and a huge concern for people who die while in hospitals or under treatment unnecessarily. This is, this is a very tricky, sensitive definition. What do you mean by unnecessary deaths? What do you mean by preventable deaths? But anyway, people like to count. And people like to compare. And if you count and compare, then this is a, the the numbers from 2000 to 2008 from Johns Hopkins University. They say, well, medical error is the third leading cause of death. The leading cause is heart disease, then you've got cancer, uh, then you've got medical error, then you've got respiratory disease, accidents, stroke, Alzheimer's, diabetes, flu, and so on. So, but unlike the others, medical error is not a disease. It's not an illness. Uh, it's some, some, something that someone did, at least that's what we think it is. That, that, that's another story. Uh, so they have it there, and of course, people like to, to make things dramatic. Not only do they say it's the third largest cause of death in the US, but there's so many that it's like, it's 251,000 lives per year. It's so many, it's like a jumbo jet that crashes every day full of patients that die. That, no, it's not full of patients, of course, but that's people like, oh, it's so big, it's like a jumbo jet crashing every day. And then you get headlines, and then you get funding, and then you get the PhD students, and so on, and everybody's happy. Uh, so people like to that, they say, it's, it's a serious, serious, serious problem. Um, and that's what I want to talk about. Not, not that I'm going to say this is not a serious problem. Of course it's a serious problem, but maybe we look at it in the wrong way. People have always been concerned about safety from, from time beginning, from beginning of, of civilization a couple of hundred thousand years ago. Uh, people have been concerned when things went wrong, when something happened that shouldn't have happened, when you were bitten by a tiger or, or you lost control of the fire in your cave or the roof fell down, or you ate something that was poisoning, or somebody hit you, or you fell, or whatever. We have always been concerned about things going wrong, and we have been trying, when something goes wrong, we try to do two things. We try to understand what went wrong, because if we understand it, then we can do something so it doesn't happen again. And we also try to explain it so we feel safe. The feeling of safety is very important. So there's, there are two things, there's being safe and feeling safe. And, and what safety managers do and risk managers and safety specialists and so on try, is trying to be safe. And what others do, managers and politicians and others, they try to make us feel safe. And sometimes there's a little conflict between the two. Sometimes you can't be safe, but it's very often people will go out and say, like, like a couple of weeks ago, when there was a train accident in southern Italy, two trains collided on a single track railroad. The first thing that happens was that the head of the region goes to the press and says, we will make sure we will investigate this in every detail so it doesn't happen again, so you can feel safe. So the public will say, oh, it's good. Somebody is looking after us. We can be safe. We don't have to worry about this. Uh, and then sometimes that comes in the way of actually finding out what happens. But, but when we try to Find, to find an explanation, you can say the first type of explanation we had in, in before technical times, before the first industrial revolution, was that the explanation when something went wrong was it was nature, or it was God. It was something we couldn't control. And if you say, well, it's an act of God, that means you can feel safe again, maybe. But you cannot be safe because you can't change what God does. I mean, God has his own will, so it doesn't really help us to be safe. We can feel safe and say, oh, it's the will of the God. People still say that. 
it's a will of the gods, it's Allah, it's whatever you believe in, it's a tsunami, it's a natural disaster. Uh, so we sort of say, okay, there's an explanation. We can't use it too very much, but that's an explanation. The worst thing that can happen is that something happens and people say, we don't know why it happened. We have no idea, we can't explain it. Everybody gets nervous. Then we started to build things, buildings, bridges, uh, carriages, cars, uh, ships, whatever. And things started to fail, but then we started to see, ah, it's a technical failure. Something went wrong, something broke, which is nice. Because then you can be safe, you can make sure it doesn't happen again, and you can feel safe. You say, ah, now we, we can repair this. this, this will not happen again. And everything was nice up until 1979, because in 1979 something happened that were, which could not be explained as a technical failure, so we have to have an explanation. We can't say it's not a technical failure, but we don't know what it is. So we say it's not a technical failure, oh, it's a human error. So human errors uh, is nice because you point to somebody and say, this is the person who did. The third largest cause of death in, in, in the US is medical error. So some, some, some person in the medical system made an error. Uh, it makes us feel safe. We don't really know what to do about it, but, it, but it's, it's an accepted explanation. Uh, then some years later, we've, we found that uh, there was not enough to say human error, so people said oh, it's, it's organizational error, it's safety culture. That is why things go wrong. So we, can, we, we feel safe, we say it's safety culture, uh, we don't become much safer because nobody knows what to do about safety culture. But we have a name for it, and later again we say oh, it's a complex system, that's why it goes wrong, it's a complex system. Uh, which maybe makes us feel safe, I'm not sure, uh, but certainly it doesn't make us safer because nobody knows what to do about complex systems, except that uh, we try to make them even more complex. So in all this, the, the, the attitude to safety is this, that when something goes wrong, let me use a laser, when something goes wrong here, we try to find the cause, we go backwards, try to find the cause, and we try to eliminate the cause. And then we're safe again. And usually we say, well, something goes wrong here because somebody did something that was wrong there. Somebody goofed up, somebody made an error, medical error, whatever. But many things don't go wrong, but they actually work well. And when things work well, then of course, you could say, well, why did they work well? What was the reason why it worked? Except we never say that, or rarely say that. But if we say that, if we speculate about that, then people say, well, it worked well because everything worked as you should, because everything was perfect, because the, the instructions were perfect, because the training of people was up to date, because all the equipment was in order, because all the software worked, because it was neither too hot or too cold or too noisy or, or whatever, so it, that's why it worked. But we never ask that question. But if we ask, that's what we say. It only worked because everything was perfect. <coughs> We look at what happens when it goes wrong. Here we have a case, a very uh, quite famous case in, in medical history, the Vin Christine accident, where they got uh, a number of, of people who were on the treatment, chemotherapy, got Vin Christine uh, um, uh, uh, by the spinal root. No, it should, it should have been, no, why the spinal root? It should have been intrathetically, but they got it in a different way and they die. They usually die very quickly. And, and people analyze that and they say, well, uh, it was delivered in the, by the wrong route, oh, sorry, by the spinal route. I'm not a doctor, so I, w I wouldn't know. It was delivered in the wrong way, and it's because of social factors, of education training, because of tasks, because of patients, because of individual factors, because of working conditions, because of the equipment, because of communication failures, because of organizational failures. So we find a number of different explanations for it, and we say, well, Let's do something about this, let's do something about this. We, we take the ones that are easiest first, then we do something about them. And then when we run out of breath or time or money, we stop doing anything. But we, we explain it, everybody is happy, we can explain it. 
Uh, and that's why we get to this definition of safety. The first definition of safety is safety is the prevention of harm, in this case, to patients. But generally, safety is the prevention of harm. Safety is measured as the number of accidents. So we say, how safe are we? You say, well, tell me how many accidents you have, and I'll tell you how safe you are. Which is a bit paradoxical, because uh, um, you actually measure something, and if you become better, safer, then there's less to measure. The measurement goes down instead of going up. Because if you become better, the measurement should go up, shouldn't it? But when you measure safety, if you become better, the measurement goes down, which is a little strange, but we have become used to it. So we have these, and, if you, it's, and, and it's nice because you can count accidents. You can count how many collisions are in a train. I'm amazed. Orlando drives me almost every day. I'm amazed I haven't had an accident yet. Not because of Orlando, but because of the traffic here in Rio. It's because of Orlando I don't have an accident. But the traffic here in Rio is murderous. I mean, I wouldn't drive myself. So I, I don't know what the statistics are here in, in, in Rio. We'll see. But you, you have this, this uh, patients, pa interesting patient safety indicators, the number of deaths, the number of, of uh, pneumothorax, thoraxes, the number of res respiratory failures, the number of, of accidental punctures and so on. Safety is measured by the number of things that go wrong, and you add them together, then you have a measure of safety. Well, we are used to that. So, so this is what, what resilience engineering started, and, and even before resilience engineering, people started to say, this can't be right. Jim Reason pointed that out, too, that it's paradoxical that safety is defined by its opposite. So the definition of safety is that safety is a condition where the number of things is that go wrong is as low as possible. It means that you define safety by the absence of safety. You define safety by when things go wrong, which are situations where there is an absence of safety. So you define safety by its opposite, not by what it is, but by what it isn't. And it also means if you want to learn about safety, you study situations where there's been an accident, which is a situation where there's no safety. So you say, I want to learn about safety, so I look for situations where I say there's no safety, and then I study it, which is very strange, scientifically. How can you study something when it's not there? You should study things when they're there, not when they're not there. Uh, but in safety, we do it the other way around. We study things in situations where we say it's not there. So let's go and look at it. Uh, and this is what resilience engineering and, and, and resilient healthcare in particular says. This, is, this can't be right. Uh, there must be another way of doing it. So what we do is, is this. We say safety, we are safe. If we, if we take this glass here as a metaphor for safety, <coughs> then we say we're safe if it's empty. This glass is full of things that go wrong. And we say, if nothing goes wrong, then we're safe. So we try to see what goes wrong. We try to analyze it. We try to find the cause. We try to eliminate it. And if nothing goes wrong, then we're safe. If we have no accidents, then we're safe. Then we're 100% safe. Higher safety means a lower number of accidents. So that's how we do. And that's what you have in medicine. You have the primum non nocere. First of all, do no harm. That's sort of the, the, uh, the oath or whatever, the Hippocratic oath. First of all, do no harm. Every doctor has to, I don't know whether sign that or swear that or whatever when, when, they, when they get their authorization, but that's still the case. First of all, do no harm. And it makes sense, of course. You shouldn't do harm. Uh, but that's how we deal with safety. If you look at it in a different way and say, well, this is what happens in, an, in a hospital, in an organization, in, in a laboratory, in a factory, a lot of things happen, and they're variable. A lot of things happen all the time, and they're, they're always variable. They're never, never straight line. I mean, it's, it's always things you, that, that sort of uh, that change and modify and improvise and so on. So on. But what will we do when, when, when we look at safety? Well, we only look at the accidents. We look at snapshots of situations where the system did not work. And we think that by looking at snapshots, and these are random snapshots of situations 
where the system doesn't work, then we can actually figure out how to make it work. That's not really smart. Because of course we can't that if you put it in this way. But that's what safety management is. Safety management is not the management of this, which is safe, safe performance. Safety management is the management of this, which is unsafe performance. And if you look at it and say, well, how many things go wrong? This is a report from, from uh, last year, 2014, I believe, from, from England about uh, serious hazards of transfusion. Trans I mean, there's a lot of blood transfusions in, in hospitals, and sometimes they go wrong. And they report when they go wrong. And in 2014, they had 3,017 reported cases of serious hazards of transfusion. Last year, they had 3,255. So it hasn't improved. Of these, they know. Uh, I can't read the number here, but for instance, they know that 77.8% were due to human error, and the rest were due to something else. So we know, they know exactly 3,017 reported cases of transfusion going wrong. And I talked to these people, and I work a little with them, so I ask them a very, what I think is a very simple question. I say, how many the denominator, how many transfusions go right? How many transfusions do you carry out every year in the United Kingdom? What's the answer? The answer is, we don't know. They don't know. They, ha they don't count. They have no idea. And, 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 the, and the, the head doctor I talked to said, well, the best thing we can do is we know how many bags of blood we use every year. Uh, and we know s may most of them are used for transfusions. Others are used for other, for other things, and some of them are lost. And we sort of know that, on average, a transfusion uses so and so many bags, but some uses a lot more blood, some uses very little blood. So we can perhaps give an estimate of how many transfusions there are. But but the interesting thing is, they don't even bother to count. They don't know, simply don't know, and they don't care. They don't care about how many transfusions actually work. They care about the transfusions and fail. And they say, so when I talk to them, I say, and they could see, they say, this, this is not really smart. You should, it's fine to look at this, but you should also look at this. Another way of putting that is to, I don't know if you can see, there's a thin red line here. So this, this illustrates 10,000 events. This illustrates one event out of the 10,000 that fails. And the green illustrates 9,999 out of 10,000 that don't fail. So what do we do in safety and risk management and so on? We look at the one event out of the 10,000 that fails. Because we have to, we must report it, the laws that tells us to report them, we count them, we categorize them, we classify them, we analyze them, uh, and we report them. We write, uh, almost said songs about them, we write books about them, we write papers about them, we go to conferences, and we stand up and talk to each other about them. No end. And not only in healthcare, everywhere else we do that. We look at the cases that went wrong, and we, we study, we know a lot about them, which is not unreasonable. Of course, we should know about them. But what Resilient Healthcare says, and what Safety 2 says, what about the 9,999 events that worked? Well, first of all, as you saw in the serious hazards of transfusion, they don't even know how many there are. They don't count them. In other fields, they do count them. Uh, but not many fields. The only field I know that, that consistently counts them is uh, air traffic management, because they count exactly how many movements of aircraft there are in an airport. It's automatically registered. And I know, I think it's from 2012, in Frankfurt Airport, there were 700 and, I don't know ex the exact number, but they have the exact number, 700,134 700, movements of aircraft. There were 21 reported cases of 
infringement, the aircraft come too close to each other or come to the wrong runway, but there were no accidents. So at least you have 21 or 23 out of 700,000. You have an idea about what the proportion is. But they don't study the 700,000. They don't know about what, what, what happens in detail. But if you look at it, and therefore we have the colors, green is safe, red is unsafe. So safety should really be about understanding the green and not understanding the red. Some people have, have uh, some clever people have realized that a number of years ago, and one of them, a professor at, at Michigan, Karl Weig, very, very clever man, said, well, the first definition was safety is the number of accidents. But then he said, no, no, safety is a dynamic non-event. Safety is when nothing goes wrong. It's a non-event. Nothing happens. No accidents. That's clever. It's a dynamic non-event because you have to do something to make sure there is a non-event. It's not automatic. That's clever too. I agree. The problem is if you want to measure safety, then safety is the number of non-events. How do you count a non-event? How do you count something that doesn't happen? How do you count how many traffic collisions don't happen? How do you count how many uh, serious hazards or transfusion don't happen? And, you can't, and that's a problem. It's a very smart definition, but it has a problem. You can't measure it. You cannot count the number of things that don't happen because you don't know how many there are. Um, so it, it goes in the right direction, but, but it's, and it raises a very, very important problem, but of course it doesn't solve it. The, qu the question is then, what happens when nothing happens? What happens when we have the green? What happens when you have transfusions that, you, that just work as they should? And, uh, and people haven't really studied that very much, but, but a very simple example is this. You take, take uh, a train station or a shopping mall. You're going to Tokyo. You should, if you get a chance, you should go there. This is the Shinjuku train station in the western part of Tokyo. Country is not there, but it's a great place. We, and I use this picture because it's Shinjuku train station, 3.5 million people walk through the train station every day. A lot of people. And the question is how many people collide with each other as they walk through every day? The answer is no one knows, of course. But and I've been there, and if you go, you can just go, you'll be near Tokyo Station. Tokyo Station is about the same. Or take any big train station, a bus station, or a shopping mall, and look at it and see how many people collide with each other as they walk through a crowd of people. And the answer is very, very few. When, we, when you walk through yourself, it's unusual, that, and, and normally you don't collide with other people, you just walk through. But the interesting question is not why do you collide with people when you collide with them. The interesting question is why don't you collide with people when you walk through a crowd of people? That's a fascinating question. What happens when it works? What happens when it goes right? Why don't you collide with other people when you walk through a crowd? You do it every day. So you can give me the answer. Can't you? I mean, you do it every day. Why don't you collide? with other people when you walk through a crowd of people? Come on, somebody can tell me. Or do you always collide with other people when you walk in a crowd? Hmm? Uh, ex exactly. The small adjustments. We walk and we, and we don't walk in a straight line unless you're very big and strong and so on. Most of us <laughs> don't walk in a straight line. But we walk and we see, we don't look at other people, we see other people, we see how they walk. We notice through the corner, the corner of our eyes, the periphery of the vision, and we, as you say, adjust how we walk. We, and, and others adjust how they walk to how we walk, and we, nobody pays any attention to it. 
because we're doing other things at the same time. We're looking at the mobile phone or talking on the phone or, or eating an ice cream or whatever we're doing. Or, or so, but that's what happens. And, and the, 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 the point is, if you really, really want to be safe, we should understand what happens when nothing happens. Because if we could become better at that, then we become safer. So we have to look at what happens when nothing happens. <coughs> And we're used to, in, in, uh, in work analysis, we have an idea that, uh, about how work should be done. That's why you have instructions, you have guidelines, and so on. Uh, work should be done in a certain place, and we call it work as imagined. It doesn't mean it's, sort of, it's a wild imagination. It's a very controlled way of thinking about how should something be done. That's why. That's why Dewey introduced the, the Dewey system for classifying literature so we can go and find the books in the library. It makes sense. There must be some order. So we have an idea about what should happen when, when we plan work. We have an idea about what should happen when we manage work. We have an idea about what should happen when we investigate what has happened. But in addition to our idea about what should happen, work as imagined, there's also what actually happens. And what actually happens is always different from what we expect would happen. And, and to make it, take a simple example, don't think about it as you against other people. Think about it against you against yourself. Because when you come to work in the morning, you have an idea about what you will have done by the end of the day. You have a plan for your work. And by the end of the day, particularly in the kind of work that I guess that, that you do and that I do, we sometimes realize we didn't do what we had planned to do. So work as done and work as imagined don't match completely. We also, during the day, we adjust our expectations of what we want to or plan or hope we can do during the day. So we have a continuous adjustment there. There's always a difference. And there's nothing wrong in being a difference. There's a difference because we have an imperfect prediction and imperfect control of the working environment. That's why somebody, if you have the power, you can say, don't let anybody in, don't disturb me, I'll just sit here and, and, and write some brilliant books all day or whatever. But it's very rare that we do that. So in, in, in the, our own situation, we have this discrepancy between workers in matching and workers done, but we can adjust it continuously because it's ourselves. The problem is when we manage other people's work, we can't adjust the, the discrepancy continuously because we can't follow their work continuously because they do their work and we do our work. So that's an issue. Uh, and that's why we have in, in safety this, this idea about, that's why we have the 200, the whatever, how many uh, 251,000 unnecessary deaths that are, that are due to, to a human medical error. We say, well, they should have done it differently because here is the procedure, here are the rules. Here, is, here are the rules for emergency surgery of a fractured neck or femur is somewhere up here. <clears throat> and there was a study done uh, five years ago and it says, for this emergency surgery procedure of this part of the hip, there are about 75 guidelines and procedures. And that's work as imagined. So there are 75 different people or groups who have an idea about how this work should be done and they each write their own guidelines and procedures and, and so on. And, and some of them are listed here. Uh, but of course, work as done never matches any of these completely and it never matches all of them complete is simply impossible, but it's still done and it's done well and it, it's, it's usually a very successful operation. So we should say it's not successful because it happens in this way, but we should understand why it is successful. Take another example. This is on a different level. These are the people in the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Service who are in charge of managing the quality of work in hospitals. So they're what you call quality management, quality assurance people. They're the surveyors that go out and check that everything is done according to the book. And I don't know if you have, you, I guess you have accreditation schemes here in Brazil. We certainly have in Denmark. Hospitals are accredited and they get ratings and so on. 
it's important for funding and public trust and, and stuff like that. So people go out and do that. But I found their own manuals and the manuals of the people who are supposed to go out and check what other people do contains 1,164 regulations and guidelines. So these are the people that check if other people follow the regulations and guidelines. And something tells me they don't follow 1,164 regulations and guidelines themselves. How could you? Impossible. So you always have this difference and it's not to say that, that work has done is wrong or work has imagined is wrong. It's just to be aware that there is this difference and it is important. This is another study that we did in, in, uh, in Scotland two years ago. This is about blood transfusion. And, and we have the formal description of how you make a blood transfusion. And this is the one. Nine steps written by the National Health Service in the UK. That's how you make a blood transfusion. Now some of you recognize this, this, uh, this uh, spaghetti-like thing behind here. This is what we call a FRAM model. This is basically a model, a description of what actually happens. And this, is, this description is made by the doctors and the nurses and the lab assistants, the phlebotomists and so on, that actually make the transfusions. They sat down, we worked with them, we, because this is special formalism, but they say, well, this, what, as you see behind, this is how a transfusion is made. And you can easily see that work is done, work is imagined, sorry, and work is done are quite different. And if you want to improve blood transfusions, what should you work from? Should you work from this, or should you work from this? This is a rhetorical question, and uh, you should guess what the answer is, of course. So we come back to exactly as when you walk in a crowd, work must be flexible. Everyday work, clinical work, and any other kind of work must be flexible. We must all the time adjust what we do to the conditions, to the situations. There's no way around it because it, the conditions are never perfect and never as we have imagined. When we do that, then we find, and, and we have studied that for a number of years now, that the reason why we have successful outcomes, the reason why things go well, is that we are able to adjust what we do to the situation. The reason why you can walk through a crowd of people without colliding with other people is that you adjust what you do in the way you walk. Without noticing, without paying attention to, and without taking decisions you just do it. And we find this is also the reason why it goes wrong. The reason why we have failures is not that we make human errors. The reason why we have failures is that we, all, that we and others adjust what we do to the situation all the time. And sometimes these adjustments don't match up completely. But it's not because we made a failure. So we need to understand why things go wrong in a different way. And this has a consequence that when something goes wrong, and, and every now and then there are things that are unacceptable outcomes. There are things that happen that we didn't want to happen. And we say, well, why did, why did this happen when we wanted this to happen? But in this perspective, instead of saying, well, let's try and find the cause of that, we say, well, this happened instead of this. But this has happened before. This has this is something we have done many times before. It has worked well many times before. Let's start by understanding why it works well. And once you understand why it works well, then you can go down and understand why it didn't work in this situation. There's no special explanation here. The explanation here is a variation of what people normally do and normally did. So this leads to, to this definition of safety that we call safety too. It basically says safety is a situation where the number of things that go right, the number of successful outcomes, is as high as possible. So instead of so so what we should try to do to be safe is to make sure that as many things as possible go right, instead of trying to prevent us that the few things that go wrong go wrong. Because if you, if you make things go right, if, if something goes right, the interesting thing is if something 
goes right, then it doesn't go wrong at the same time. It can't go right and go wrong at the same time. Either it goes right or it goes wrong. And if you try to make it go right, then you also prevent it from going wrong, but not by preventing it, but by facilitating it, by supporting it, and you become more productive with it and so on. So, so we need to, instead of thinking about risks and say we have risk-based management, we think about how something can go wrong and then we try to prevent that. We should have opportunity-based management. We should think about how things could go right, how could, how could they work, and what can we do to facilitate that? What can we do to support that? So when you think about safety, we should think about positive situations. A safe situation is a situation where something works, where something goes well. It's not where something fails. So safety is, is uh, looking at the positive. Safety measurements is measuring something that becomes larger and larger and larger. Safety is a system is safe if as much as possible goes right. So we have the third interpretation of safety. Safety is the number of acceptable outcomes. Now that makes sense because first of all you need to define what these outcomes are but of course you can define them and of course you can count them and of course you can measure them but you, you count and measure what goes well and not what goes wrong which means that the more safety you have the larger the number is and there's no limit to it. It can become as large as possible, unless you go up to percentages, then it can't become larger than 100%. But there's no limit to it. How many things go well? Study how many things go well. Try to make them go well. That's, that's the third definition of safety, the third interpretation of safety. And it's very practical. It's very easy to do. So to so come back to this, what we really are interested in is this. We're interested in the variability of of performance and we need to study that performance in itself not by not by focusing on when it when it failed and went wrong because by focusing on when it failed and went wrong we don't learn very much about how it works when it works we should study it when it works we should look at work as it happens uh, and, and some people say well nothing happens when it goes right uh, by which I mean there's nothing unusual that happens, but it's the usual that's more interesting than the unusual. So if you take this analogy again, we can say, well, safety is if this is full. We're safe if everything goes right. And, and to make it full, we should understand how it goes right and become better at making it go right. There will still be things that go wrong. There will still be the little red bubbles in there. But by and large, safety is trying to make everything go right as much as possible. And the way to do that is to, we should look at what happens all the time, not what happens exceptionally. We shouldn't look at snapshots. We should look at ev everyday performance, at everyday behavior. Uh, we should look at work as done, not as work as imagined, not, not at the instructions, not count the the number of cases where the instructions didn't match what actually happened because they will never match what actually happened. But we should try and understand what actually happens and see how, how work is done. And, 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 and it's actually relatively easy to do and, and, and the, the benefits are quite large. We should try to learn, but when we learn, <coughs> normally when we learn from in safety, we look at things that go wrong and and the more serious something is, we say the more important it is to learn. But this perspective says, safety two perspective say, no, it's not how serious it is, it's how often it happens. The more frequent something happens, the more important it is to learn from it. Because it's the small variations of the what happens frequently that could lead to accidents, but also could lead to improvements if, if we deal with them. So instead of saying primum non nocere, first of all, do no harm, we should say primum bene factor, first of all, do well. Funnily enough, or interestingly enough, the WHO, the World Health Organization, itself says this, health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. And I agree. 
Safety is not merely the absence of accidents and incidents. Safety is something in itself. Safety is not when you're without accidents. Safety is when you're with, when you have good, acceptable performance. So with that, that's all. I hope it gives you an idea about what we do in, 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 in resilient engineering and resilient healthcare. We have three books. One, this has actually come out in the fall. The first book, Resilient Healthcare, which strangely enough is also in Japanese, if, you, if it's easier to read Japanese than, than English. Uh, we have the second one called The Resilience of Everyday Clinical Work, and we heard the third one called the called, uh, uh, Reconciling Work as Imagined and Work as Done. <laughs> so the first one try, gives sort of the scientific, scientific foundation for all this. The second one describes the phenomena of the everyday clinical work, and the third one begins to sell what should we do about it and how can we improve it. So the three books sort of go together in a kind of a trilogy. Uh, and uh, if you want to find out more, there is a website where you can, can find information and, and materials and presentation from the meetings that have been had so far. And, and uh, well, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Dr. Eric. And it's, it's really a good opportunity. And uh, I really would like to say thank you for the clarity of your presentation. I was uh, trying to, I read some papers uh, about resilient healthcare in the last three weeks. And uh, it was very, it's much easier now to understand what it is after your presentation. Thank you very much. Then let's... Professor Holnagel, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. It's a great pleasure to interview you again after four years. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's nice to be back in Brazil again. It's, it's an honor. So to get us started, I would like to talk about your trajectory. How did your research, traje how did your research trajectory lead you to patient safety? 